Hey, this is Imperfect Paradise from LAS Studios. I'm your host, Antonia Cerejido. This is The Castle Part 2. Last episode, we met Carly Usedin and learned about how they got obsessed with a members-only club in Hollywood called The Magic Castle and spent a whole year learning magic to access the space. It felt like you were back in time in a place where, like, almost everyone there is an older, white, cis, heterosexual man. It's their world that you're stepping into. And Carly was excited to be part of changing the castle by bringing their friends and maybe even starting a club for queer magicians. Coming up on the show, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and protests in 2020, Carly reaches a breaking point and the Magic Castle faces a reckoning. I still to this day will not enter the building alone. We are not a truck with an engine. We are one wheel on a radio flyer wagon squeaking a little bit in the distance, hoping someone will listen. Change has never happened quickly enough, uh, but we have to be mindful about everybody's opinion. I had good intentions, at least 50% good intentions. And then I think 50% kind of like chaotic screaming and like just having hit a wall and like feeling powerless. Here's LA's senior producer, Natalie Chudnovsky. I asked Carly to show me a magic trick. These are two rubber bands. I'm going to hand them to you. One of the only tricks they still remember. What I'm going to do is connect them here. Now, as you can see, they are linked until I blow on them. Whoa. And now, you can't, this is an audio <laughs> medium, but what I did was I separated the rubber bands into separate rubber bands. I'm impressed. And you're not allowed to show it to me again. I will show it to you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Back around 2015, Carly actually used to teach this rubber band trick. There was this thing my friends created years ago called A Camp, which was basically a queer camp for adults. And at that time I was a member and I had just learned everything and it was like really fresh. And I was like, I'm going to teach a magic class. And so I taught like a bunch of other queer adults to do magic. I was like, this is the future liberals want. This was back when Carly had just become an official member of the Magic Castle, and they were excited about everything that came along with that. Pins and branded tchotchkes, a new member orientation, and a members-only Facebook group. There were dues, $745 a year at that point. And to me, that felt like a fine price to pay to not only support the club and help it stay open, but also to have access to the space and all the fun that could arise there. There was paperwork, the member's code of conduct, which laid out how members should behave. For example, that they shouldn't sully the name of the castle. And you also got the sticker to put on your windshield. So when you drove up to the castle, the attendant immediately knew that you were a member. Kind of like in the spot where like the oil change sticker is. And so when you pull up the valley, greets you with welcome home. Welcome home. It was 2015, and Carly was in their honeymoon phase with the castle. And now that they were a member, they'd get to do something they'd been looking forward to for a year. Introduce the castle to their friends. And that's where it all started to go wrong. I was so proud of being a member because of all it took to become a member. And I really, really thought it was such a special place. So I was so excited to bring friends. And usually we'd have a good time. We'd see some magic. We'd have some cocktails. And then, like, the amount of instances where we would leave and we'd all have, like, a really weird story to discuss as we were waiting for the car at ballet, that number started to rise. We're like, what a fun night. Yeah, that was fun. That one thing was, that was messed up, though. Yeah, that was, that wasn't great. This episode is about Carly's years as a member of the Magic Castle and the boiling point around equity and police that roiled 2020. This is part two of Imperfect Paradise, The Castle. I'm Natalie Chanofsky.
You're listening to Imperfect Paradise, The Castle. I'm Natalie Janowski. So I used the internet, the Wayback Machine, to look up the dress code from from 2015. Oh my God. There's two columns, one for men, one for women. In the men column, think business attire, men must be in coat and tie. For women, think elegant attire. Hmm. Women must be in a dress, cocktail dress, elegant skirt and blouse combination, pantsuit with a matching jacket. There's some exceptions for ethnic and religious attire. It's like women have to be elegant and men are business. Like, it's just very like magician and magician's assistant. When Carly brought friends, they'd sort of translate the castle's aesthetic. I would give them a more personal touch of the dress code. Like, oh, just wear an outfit like you wore to this thing or wear a suit or whatever, depending on their own gender expression and just who I know them to be. But I would always send them the link to the website so we could all have a laugh. (laughs) And also probably subconsciously to prepare them for like, you're stepping back in time in this space a little bit. Despite misgivings, Carly was sort of laughing off the dress code with their friends. But still, I was curious how it all made Carly feel. When I was in that space, uh, it was Carly, a woman, she, her pronouns, but dressed in like suits with short hair. And now I'm Carly, they, them pronouns, a non-binary trans person who would be wearing a suit and look the same. But my gender is read by people differently in every environment I go into. How did you feel like people read you at the castle? Obviously, acknowledging that everyone is different. I was usually read male in the castle. It was like a very binary world in that space. It is like you are back in time in like the 50s. And anyone in a suit is a guy. Anyone in a dress is a gal. And like, the guys should hold the door open for the gals. Like, it is deeply that. (laughs) And you were someone who was complicating that binary. So what did that mean for you when you were there? I would try to just like be as unnoticeable as possible. When I would be in that space, I would actively try to make myself smaller because I just didn't want to deal with it. And then when I brought people, I would, you know, there was like that mix of like pridefully showing them around. But then also like knowing in the back of my mind that most of the people that work here are going to call me sir. Carly still really enjoyed being other people's ticket into the castle, but there kept being incidents, like this one time. My wife's birthday one year, they have a thing called the Houdini Seance. It's like an hour or two long performance where they summon the ghost of Houdini. It's like a little cheesy in like a Disney's Haunted Mansion sort of way, but like so fun. We had requested this one performer to do the seance, a female magician. And we get there and it's just some dude. And like no one told us about the switch. We had a group of like queer people, trans people, black people, and this guy trying to talk to us. It was like misgendering everybody in our group, saying ma'am to people who are trans men. Like assumptions of heterosexuality, like who's your husband? Who's a handsome man? And you're like, you know, that kind of garbage. And you're like... First of all, this person's queer. Second of all, what does that have to do with Houdini? Carly was starting to realize that the old-timey atmosphere they'd initially been so charmed by had drawbacks. When you walk in and you feel like you're being transported somewhere else, there's a cool part of that, that you're immersed in a magical environment, and then there's a terrible part of that that you're kind of, like, shoved back many years into this, like, very hetero white, patriarchal environment. The older, white, cis, heterosexual male members, they acted like it was their playground. Just walking around in the space and hear them saying something gross about how a woman looked. Uh, Something, you know, very sexual. I saw several white male performers with very sexist patter. That their routines involved making jokes about women. Um, One time, a man made a joke about his own assistant, and that assistant was his daughter. And that made me feel quite ill. And when it came to female performers... When you look at the schedule for the week and you see who the performers are, usually there's not a single woman listed, and usually it's all white men. This is something Kayla Drescher 
was really attuned to. And I know this because I have Excel spreadsheets examining how women are booked throughout the building. Kayla says casual misogyny has always been a part of her life in magic. I've been doing magic since I was seven. And the very first day that I walked into a magic club, the other kids told me that magic isn't for girls. And one kid offered that if I wanted, I could stay and be his assistant. And that was my very first day in the magic community. (laughs) Kayla joined the castle around the same time as Carly. But unlike Carly, Kayla wasn't a hobbyist. She's a professional. So for years, she was a booked performer and teacher at the castle. And she noticed the lack of female performers right away. She and a friend started this spreadsheet as an unpaid, unofficial project to examine how the castle booked performers of different genders. Oh, I got it. Okay, perfect. Kayla emailed it to me while we were on the phone. So I'm opening the overall stats. (laughs) <laughs> By Davids, Jeffs, and Johns. Do you mean literally people named Davids, Jeffs, and Johns? Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. You got it. <laughs> so besides the fact that in 2017, more magicians named John performed at the castle than women in total, here's what I found most interesting in Kayla's spreadsheet. Between 2016 and 2019, the percentage of women performers grew from about 6 to about 9%. If you remember from last episode, this actually tracks with the low ratio of women in magic. And Kayla's data also accounts for where performers are slotted, which theaters and which times. And she found that women tended to get the less prestigious slots, brunches and early shows. In 2019, Kayla presented these findings to the people who run the castle, the board of directors. When I asked the castle about it in 2023, they told me that as a result of the presentation, they made an effort to book at least one woman per week, as well as magicians from underrepresented backgrounds. They didn't address time slots or locations. Around 2018, Kayla and Carly actually met through a mutual friend, But Kayla never shared her spreadsheet with Carly, and Carly didn't share their experiences either. So Carly was feeling alone and increasingly disillusioned. I kind of just sat with all of it, and it felt like, for someone like me, the price of admission to this space is $800 a year and, like, putting up with some bullshit. I think I was just like, "This this is how this space is, and if I want to be a part of it, then I kind of need to suck it up. Well, what I'm hearing is like, that was how you were there when you were alone, but maybe when you were taking your friends there, you were kind of seeing it through their eyes. That's absolutely correct. All the little things I would notice were just for me. Once I started bringing my friends into the space, then I felt complicit and accountable. I just started worrying that I was bringing people into a space where they might not be safe And I couldn't do that anymore. So it became a thing to me where like, well, if I'm going to go to the castle, I'll go alone. Um, And then it just became a thing of like, why am I going at all? Whenever they would say welcome home and you when you drive up to the valet, it's like, this isn't my home. (laughs) You know, it didn't feel like a place for me. How did that affect you and your magic practice? Like, were you still learning new tricks? Mm -mm. I stopped learning. I would see people I hadn't seen in a while and be like, do a magic trick. And I'd be like, I can't. You had expressed that you wanted to bring in your friends, and then the other thing you wanted to do was potentially carve out a queer space. Did you make any moves towards that? No. Um, I didn't know how. And I had just sort of convinced myself that it would not have been met with, like, open arms, like, that that may, maybe would not have had a positive reception. And I take full responsibility for my inaction there. I do look back at that and wish that I had maybe tried, like had made any effort. I guess I never really felt welcome enough to try to make it better. And I think that's probably what it comes down to. And I regret that. I was definitely not like going in, advocating, trying to make my voice heard in a way that like I would normally do in my career, let's say. And I don't know if that's the difference between a career and a hobby. Like, maybe I just didn't want to work as hard in that space. I wanted it to just be easier. 
I didn't want everything in my life to be that struggle. Carly had been a member for five years, and by the end, they'd kind of stopped going to the castle. They said it wasn't a conscious decision. They were still paying dues, but they let life get in the way. And then what happens in 2020? Well, COVID, everything shuts down, including the castle. In the summer of 2020, there were a lot of protests here in L.A. after the murder of George Floyd. And I was not expecting that to seep into my life at the castle, but it they intersected in a very weird way. Carly would go out and protest, and when they got home, they'd log onto Twitter to follow the news online. One day, they're scrolling, and... I saw a tweet get shared into my feed that was a screenshot of a Facebook post hosted by the Magic Castle. Amidst the protests, the Magic Castle Hotel, the property adjacent to the Magic Castle, had let the LEPD and National Guard set up in their empty parking lot. In the photo, a Castle Hotel staff member is giving candy bars to the National Guard. Carly honed in on the caption. Tonight our hearts are with the business owners and employees whose livelihoods have been destroyed. For Carly, this felt like the final straw. Really? I mean, that's just an incredibly racist thing to say. To be that blindly pro-police, pro the force that was attacking protesters unprovoked. I had already kind of fallen out of love with my membership of the Magic Castle. And then seeing this just felt like a punch in the gut. So then I did something. That's after the break on Imperfect Paradise. You're listening to Imperfect Paradise. I'm Natalie Janowski. Carly is seeing this screenshot rack up shares on Twitter. And suddenly, all these pent-up feelings about the castle hit all at once. I think it was a combination of a lot of things where I felt like I had been really quiet and essentially complicit in some of this garbage for a while. And I hit a breaking point. So they post on Twitter... And I wrote, hey, at Magic Castle, at Magic Castle Hotel, what on earth are you doing? Signed a longtime member who was very angry. And then Carly goes to the Magic Castle members-only Facebook page and starts writing. I have a, a screenshot so I could read it if you would like me to read it. Going to post this knowing that I will definitely get banned from this group for doing so, but many of you need an education right now and I've got the time today. Oh my God. Who's this child? It's a long post where Carly says they weren't comfortable bringing their friends to the castle. Because of the racism and sexism I've encountered. Addresses the National Guard Facebook post. No one is calling for the looting of the Magic Castle. People were saying that by speaking out against this National Guard post, that meant that we wanted the castle to be looted. Of course we want the club and all the wonders contained therein to remain safe. Like, they're truly like our historical artifacts in this club. Like, obviously I care about that. But that is a completely different issue than giving our parking lot to the LAPD. Carly brings up what they saw going on at the protests. I've had friends put in jail all week for simply exercising their First Amendment rights. I've had journalist friends shot at point-blank range by rubber bullets. Ask yourself who these forces are protecting. If they are protecting buildings, then why are they shooting people? Links to different resources. And here is a reading list to start with if you want to step outside your comfort zone. Here's a primer on white privilege. And a final closing statement to the AMA the Academy of Magical Arts, and its clubhouse, the Magic Castle. I'd love to see the AMA turn over a new leaf and become a progressive institution dedicated to raising up newer voices in magic, voices that are not all male, not all white. And as long as I'm a member, I will be committed to helping these efforts. So I posted that on Facebook. There's definitely a part of me that was like, this is a teachable moment. And maybe they'll listen. Although when I read back the tone I took, it was like very dismissive. I think I thought I was like doing the work. I had good intentions. 
at least 50% good intentions. And then I think 50% kind of like chaotic screaming and like just having hit a wall and feeling powerless. Carly's post got 105 comments. Some members commented that they'd never personally experienced anything unsavory at the castle. Or if Carly was unhappy, they should leave. People got into fights about the castle's environment and the nature of the protests. The Magic Castle is supposed to be a non-political organization, so Carly had never explicitly seen the politics of its members. And suddenly, it was all out in the open on this Facebook group. And I was curious how the castle's leadership was reacting. This is the take of one longtime castle member and magician, Paul Draper. The castle was being run and managed by individuals who were of their time and their culture, which is one with a lot of misogyny, punching down, and a love of Orientalism. So I think they were not prepared for it. Yeah. Are there examples of that that come to mind? One of the major examples is the artwork. This was becoming a topic of discussion on the Facebook group, that the castle had all these relics of Orientalism, which was a fad in 19th century Europe. A lot of this was then appropriated by white magicians to invent personas that they would use to sell their own magic acts. That's castle member and magic historian Angela Sanchez. Uh, one particularly famous magician went by the stage name of Chung Ling Su. His real name was Will Robinson, and he was a white guy from New York, copying the act of a real Chinese magician, Ching Ling Fu. Now we'd call it Yellow Face. And kind of like the debate around Confederate statues, there was debate around what the castle should do about these paintings which in this moment, for some members, no longer felt tenable. Here's former Magic Castle member Brandon Martinez. I would make jokes about the Chung Ling Su stuff, like, oh yeah, by the way, that's uh, a white dude, and it's, it's racist, like, you know, it's the castle, what are you gonna do? After the self-realization that most people in the United States went through, you kind of go to a point where you're like, oh, that's not good enough. Carly was finally seeing people call out all the things that they'd found problematic and more. The dress code, sexist patter, how performers sometimes called up female audience members to embarrass them. This one infamous spot at a bar below the central staircase, where if you looked up, you could see up someone's skirt. And then there was the way female performers were treated at the castle. Kayla Drescher, the magician with a spreadsheet, had a lot of thoughts on this topic about the interactions she seemed to have over and over again. She recalled this one evening when a guy came up to her at one of the castle's bars. He came up and was like, sweetheart, it's time to get me a drink. And I was like, great. Uh, give the bartender a second. And he was like, how are you not the bartender? And I was like, because I'm the magician. And he was like, the little lady doesn't do any magic. And then when I started my show, he just left. Can I can I ask you something? I can imagine a defender of the castle saying, it's not our fault that some of the clientele is problematic, but that's not a reflection on the castle itself. We don't condone that. What would your response to that be? Well, my, my response to that, number one, is that man was a magician member. So that man passed an audition. He was allowed to come in. He can exist in the castle. He pays a membership. And... Of course, the castle isn't responsible for everything that somebody says. What the castle, I believe, is responsible for is creating an environment where that isn't tolerated. Kayla wanted a change in the castle's culture, and she had specific ideas. For example, a clear path for guests and performers to report incidents like assault. And that stemmed from Kayla's personal experience at the castle. They had three different instances of assault or harassment where, like, I definitely was physically assaulted by two different magicians. And then a different magician would not leave me alone, like, followed me out to my car, etc. 
Kayla says she didn't report it at the time, afraid that it would hurt her career and that she wouldn't be believed. She said the staff didn't intervene. They're just there. They're just watching. They're not doing anything. So it was in that moment I realized I died not safe here. I'm 24 at this point, so I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to speak out. I don't know how to stand up for myself. I just shut down while it was all happening. I know a lot of women who stuff like that has happened to and they immediately just quit magic. They never come back. And that, that sucked. I didn't want that to happen. And so I really intensely made sure that I didn't quit magic. I just had to be very, very conscious of how I accessed a clubhouse. So I, I still to this day will not enter the building alone. When I brought this up to the castle, they said if Kayla wants to talk with management about this now, she would be listened to and taken seriously. When I talked with Kayla, she said for her, it wasn't about calling out any specific members or staff, but about conveying the environment of the castle that made her not want to speak out in the first place. Magic is still this microcosm of the world, but of the world in like the 50s and 60s. It's a world of secrets. It's a world of don't tell anyone. It's really easy for stuff to just breed within the community and there's no outside checks and balances. All of the issues that I was experiencing with misogyny were now all packed into a clubhouse. I talked to about a dozen former and current Magic Castle members about this summer of 2020, when the Facebook group was exploding. There were whispers of an LA Times investigation, and the online conversation was starting to get ugly. The immediate response of the leadership at the castle was, well, shut down the chat board, and this causing a split off, a division of members, creating a separate account, the owl bar, where people would speak freely. It was weird because like this kind of like progressive community kind of started to get a little louder. I'm like, whoa, like-minded people in this group. Where have they been? It's like the moment they go to Toontown and Who Framed Roger Rabbit a little bit, where you're just like, oh my God, what is this world? That's how it felt. There's like this private Facebook group where like of all these like progressive, interesting people that are at the Magic Castle. People like Paul and Kayla. We started having these Zooms with anybody who wanted to come and we were just having like just open and honest conversations about how the castle treats members. Lots and lots of sharing stories. Like, wow, there's a whole lot of us on this Zoom. There's at least 20, 30 people on here. What can we do? Do we have options? Can we complain about things? Can we make suggestions? Are we going to be heard? In that moment, it felt like the answer might be yes. The castle didn't put out an apology for the parking lot situation, but after more back and forth on the Facebook group and a small protest outside the castle, they did put out a statement saying that Black lives matter. They were going to meet and consider the Orientalist artwork situation. And on June 17th, 2020, Carly saw an announcement from the castle's board of directors. The formation of an ad hoc diversity and inclusion committee that will develop ways to expand the diversity of our club and to bring the art of magic to underserved communities in the greater Los Angeles area. We know many of you would be interested in participating in this new diversity and inclusion committee. We will be establishing how to go about joining in and informing you very soon. It definitely felt like a turning point. And I'm like, is the castle going to move forward into the future? Are we going to be on the right side of history? As so many industries, as so many groups have faced those moments of like reckoning. When George Ford's murder happened, companies really felt the pinch to say, we're going to do pledges. We're going to do better. We have to do something. This is Leslie Short. She's been in the DEI space for over 25 years and has her own firm that helps companies work on their cultures. Leslie remembers that in the summer of 2020, she was booked from morning until 10 o'clock at night. And it was like that for all the folks she knew in the industry. According to the Society for Human Resource Management, 
DEI-related job openings spiked by 55% in the immediate month after George Floyd's murder. Can I ask you how many private clubs you worked with? Two. Okay. And they both decided to have DEI committees after 2020? Oh, absolutely. But so did most companies. <laughs> the castle was no different in announcing their intentions to do better. Kayla Drescher was asked to join the nascent Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and Carly wanted in, too. Encouraged by Kayla, they sent an email asking to join. I would love to be a part of that. I would love to fulfill this thing that was in the back of my mind when I first became a member of, like, there is a really great community here. Magic is really special. This is a special place. I think we can make it more inclusive, bring it to the 21st century. My anger and frustration with the situation had started to give way to optimism, excitement, hope. Like, I don't know where this is going, but maybe someone will listen. I think for a lot of people, it felt like that summer of 2020 was a turning point when problematic institutions would have to shift, when things would finally get better. That's how it felt for Carly. And then that balloon of hope punctured. How did you receive the letter? I think it was just an email. What does the subject line say? Academy of Magical Arts, Inc. Ethics and Grievance Committee. When Carly joined the Magic Castle, they had signed a member code of conduct, agreeing not to disparage the castle. And two members felt that Carly had done so when posting on Twitter and Facebook. They'd filed a grievance. Carly was at risk of being kicked out of the Magic Castle. That was LA Studios senior producer, Natalie Chudnovsky. Next time on Imperfect Paradise. As the minutes are ticking away, as this is about to start, I get incredibly nervous. It just felt a lot like we were banging our head up against the wall for nothing. And it took 10 months of us meeting before we were able to make any sort of public statement. I know that the committee was making recommendations in 2021. Why do you think it was difficult for them to because I think the first the first 2021, what the, the vision was not clear. I was not really like impressed by the way we were doing things. Plus, an explosive investigation from the LA Times rocks the members only club. That's coming up on the next episode of Imperfect Paradise, The Castle. Listen to new episodes of the podcast every Wednesday or tune in on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. on LAist 89.3 or LAist.com. Perfect Paradise the Castle is reported, written, produced, and sound designed by LA's senior producer, Natalie Chudnovsky. I'm the show's host, Antonia Serigido. Catherine Mailhouse is the executive producer of the show and our director of content development. Shana Naomi Crockmull is our vice president of podcasts. Additional production by Marina Peña. Jens Campbell is our production coordinator. Editing by Audrey Quinn. Fact-checking by Caitlin Antonios. Our theme was composed by E. Scott Kelly, who is also our engineer. Imperfect Paradise is a production of LA Studios. This podcast is powered by listeners like you. Support this show by donating now at las.com slash join. This podcast is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live.